This is a painting named The Massacre of the Innocents, painted by Peter Paul Rubens around the year 1610. It depicts, as the name suggests, the biblical massacre of the innocents, an event in the Gospel of Matthew when the king of Judea orders the execution of all newborn boys to kill the king of Jews, Jesus Christ. It is, by all accounts, an artistic masterpiece. Rubens' grasp of the human form can only be described as impeccable. His composition transforms flailing bodies into melding extensions of the surrounding cloth, there's an undeniable drama about the piece. It's the kind of art that you place on a wall and can't help but ponder and appreciate. It's simply good art, self-evidently admirable. The kind that you print on a coffee mug. The Witcher 3 is a game like that. It's self-evidently admirable. It's got impressive graphics, interesting writing. Fascinating story. Any chance you're nearing the end? exciting gameplay, it's just self-evidently impressive. If I cut up some pieces of paper and arrange them on my table, what is this? Is this art? Does it compare to, say, The Massacre of the Innocents? If The Witcher 3 is a work of fine art, Cruelty Squad is the scraps of paper on my desk. From the first moment, it just looks random. Why is your character wearing a green visor in the shower? Why is there a TV on the floor? Why is there a shootout outside your window as you take this phone call? But even more subtle artistic choices seem random. Certain camera angles are just nonsensical, and they seem to remain for seemingly random intervals. There are intentional decisions here that have zero basis in any form of intent. Look at the way that your character moves in this scene. This distortion effect, how each vertice of his body snaps into place. It's, it's not pre-made. This isn't a result of lack of care. I mean, look, this game is made in the Godot engine. It's still a relatively modern engine with 3D support. This doesn't just happen. The developer made it this way for apparently no reason. It's a bit more complicated than that, though. There's some indications of sense in here. This is a phone, and the way that your character interacts with it is by taking the phone call. You can just kind of tell that this sound is a ringtone. It has the tonality and repetitive nature of a ringtone, it's just, well, it's just a really bad one. It almost seems like a ringtone from 30 years ago, a time with completely different ideas of design and notions of pleasantness. Like the pieces of paper on my desk, even though every specific element seems random, the whole picture has some intentionality to it. There's almost a composition here, even though it appears random, the pieces are placed, they're not just thrown. Honestly, the fact that there were so many familiar elements is actually kind of surprising to me. If you go into this game having only heard some basic discourse about it, you almost expect some ego-death, esoteric, avant-garde, utterly nonsensical, hyper-philosophical experience, only to discover that Cruelty Squad is actually like a Twitch shooter. Death comes rapidly for both you and your enemies, guns are very accurate even though recoil can be high, and this combat can only be described as brutal. But what is most shocking is just how quickly your mind adapts to this insanity. In more than one way, actually. One thing that I found difficult in writing this script is talking extensively about these visuals. This color vomit insanity is rapidly normalized in your mind. It's just normal that the walls look like this. Your mind accepts this. You might think that this is insane, that there's no way that you could ever find anything intuitive about this art style. That's what I thought initially, but eventually things just become normal. Even the weird mechanics, like how reloading is done by holding right click and dragging your mouse down and back up, how certain actions are bound to strange buttons. ADS is shift. Your utility is three. Thus, we arrive at one of the foundational themes of Cruelty Squad. The game challenges your preconceptions of notions of design. Now, I think this statement can be a bit, uh, cringe. I mean, it's like when they tape a banana to the wall and say that this piece challenges traditional notions of art and value. Or, you know, when Arvin tells you to consider the intentionality of the scraps of paper on his desk. In this case, I think Cruelty Squad explores this notion in a much more meaningful way in that it engages the player's own senses to explore the concept. 
Now, this next part is a bit difficult to state definitively, because each person will experience their reaction of the game's environment differently. To me, as the visuals of the game started to seem less and less out of place, I find myself wondering what the difference is between this design and what we might consider good design in real life. I mean yes, I think everyone would agree that the environments in this game are kind of weird looking. As you've no doubt noticed, there's heavy use of extremely bright and clashing colors, strange layouts to buildings, shapes and polygons used in haphazard ways, abnormal decisions about how information is conveyed. But when I say that these things are abnormal, what the hell does that actually mean? I mean, it's strange to me, yes, but could it be described objectively as strange? Design paradigms in the 21st century lean towards minimalism, clean aesthetics, highly abstracted symbology, but let's remember that not so long ago, the design paradigms were fundamentally different. Is the weird border present throughout the game actually a strange and bizarre design decision, any more than tiling website backgrounds used to be? Are the design elements used in this website not kind of similar to those seen in Cruelty Squad? Could it be that what appears to be bizarre design in Cruelty Squad is not necessarily bizarre, but just different? Could it be that Cruelty Squad forces you to confront your understanding of what design actually is? That perhaps there's nothing inherently, objectively better about how we create visual media in our time, and that your understanding of what looks good and bad from an artistic standpoint is driven purely from what you're used to, what you're socially conditioned to like, what you've been exposed to. No, no, it's actually not that simple. See, it might be tempting to accept that conclusion, that it's all socially constructed, that we don't actually know anything, that the scraps of paper on my desk is a piece of art just as worthy of artistic praise as Ruben's masterpiece. Thank you, big brain consumer soft products, for delivering this highly complex breakdown of our preconceived notions. But the reality is that many of you will probably just look at this game's visuals and just have a feeling that regardless of how ideas of design change, regardless of what society's preferences are, this just feels bizarre. And I actually think that you're right about that. There's very few things in society that are entirely socially constructed anyway. First of all, I'll point out the obvious, this design is not mainstream in the current day. That is to say that when designing any specific part of this game, the obvious intuitive choice was not taken. If you're making a reload mechanic, the obvious choice is to just have the action of reloading bound to R. It's unintuitive to create a mechanic where we hold down right click and drag the mouse down to reload. And in this intentionality, it deviates from what might be the human approach to design. Even when the design paradigms are different than ours, the human brain and body just works better with certain methods of designing games. It makes sense to bind aim down sights to right click, because aim down sights is an action that is highly related to firing, which is bound to left mouse click because it's highly related to aiming, which is bound to mouse movement because that is the main input device that can accept free and non-quantized movement as inputs. The mouse and keyboard themselves are a result of many iterations of selective evolution gradually leading to better and better generalized input devices. These things are not the result of random design paradigms. They're not totally reflective of evolutionary processes either, but they still are reflections of the inherent nature of humans interacting with their computers. The bright colors and the violent, garish patterns present throughout the world cannot be distilled as exemplifications of arbitrary human design decisions. Colors and patterns are objectively not meaningless to humans. Through millennia of evolution, your brain is biologically wired to see bright and saturated colors as eye-catching and striking. If you were a disembodied intelligence, a simple pattern of earthly tones and a jarring pattern of contrasting colors might fundamentally be the same, but to a human brain, one is interpreted differently. Your human brain has evolved to pick out, for example, ripe fruit among earthly tones. There is no world where humans just happen to converge on neon green and pink as the neutral colors instead of white and black, for example, because neutrality and coloration is mostly not subjective. All that makes it really hard to interpret what these strange designs really mean and what they say. Maybe there is something important in the observation that these patterns do become kind of normal in your mind as you play the game. And there is some sense in which absurd aspects of our society are normalized in our own lives, I think. For example, much of the built environment in cities would be jarring to humans not used to it. Gigantic buildings and strange materials not really found in nature. They bend perspective and reflect light in ways that would look utterly alien to a medieval peasant or monarch alike. In some sense, by putting us into a place where everyone experiences being confused and seeing alien visuals, Cruelty Squad explores how humans experience strangeness. 
and perhaps we can even extend that meaning into suggesting that this game also explores how humans adapt to strangeness. One common thing that you hear about the mechanics in Cruelty Squad is that it starts out utterly unintuitive and unworkable, but you rapidly become accustomed to it, and, and you become a seasoned killing machine, taking advantage of your character's steady hand and unmoving aim to snap from target to target, unleashing a bloody avalanche of violence and terror. And you do all this with laughably awful control schemes and just atrociously, though maybe intentionally, designed shooting mechanics. In the same way that you might become used to the visuals, you become increasingly effective at the unintuitive and anti-human skills required. Your hands move themselves, your brain adapts to intuitively understand the arbitrary rule sets of the physics system, of the enemy's abilities, of the strange abstract actions required to operate a car, of the rapid shifting of your mouse to find targets, of the conceptual theories of chart analysis, of the abstract rules and regulations required for the paper or company report that maybe you should be writing right now instead of watching YouTube videos. Brilliantly, I think that Cruelty Squad extends this line of reasoning into the narrative itself, but as you can imagine, a game like this doesn't really have a clear story for you to follow. I can't say that there isn't some set of events to follow, there is. In short, you're basically a depressed loser who gets activated like a sleeper agent to work as a hitman. From there you go from a collection of targets that seem vaguely arbitrary, including your own landlord, until you confront God and kill him? In what just might be one of the most frustrating levels in any game that I have ever played, only to be outdone by one of the hidden levels that you can later unlock. See, in this world, death is meaningless. It's practically a commodity. A stock market for body parts tracks the real-time supply and demand for organs. When you die, you can reconstruct your body for a meager $500. The CEO guerrillionaires that you assassinate mostly aren't too concerned with being killed either. They'd rather make fun of you as you pull the trigger. Given the utter lack of importance of death, life itself becomes meaningless. There's no reason to strive to live to try too hard to survive. In the same way that the mechanics become familiar and life becomes unimportant, the strange and nonsensical facility of the first level quickly changes to like an upper class suburb, a small town with hundreds of citizens simply walking among those armed with light machine guns. Your sense of the environment changes. I found myself drawn to particular houses in the early suburb level. The large and ostentatious appearance of the buildings would normally mark an area of importance in any game. Instead, in Cruelty Squad, it's just an empty house. The telegraphs that you have learned throughout a childhood of gaming fall apart. I think that the most remarkable thing that Cruelty Squad does narratively is its strong conflation of these physical manifestations of humans, the life of the humans themselves, and these notions of finance. The essence of the humans in Cruelty Squad becomes financial after death, and then they become part of the human environment. The flesh of the dead becomes available on the market, then it's reused to build everything from new bodies, to other creatures, to material and structures, walls of flesh formed out of the bodies of the dead. The human itself is a financial product and commodity in the most literal sense. Cruelty Squad makes heavy use of the work of the French philosopher Georges Bataille. His themes and quotes from his writing appearing frequently in the game. Bataille's work often seems to make strange comparisons between finance and biology in a very similar way to Cruelty Squad. His concept of the accursed share is explicitly called out repeatedly. This idea that the financial system absorbs energy, newly generated value, with a certain efficiency that's not 100%, and excess energy is expelled in wasteful ways, manifest in strange, ostentatious spending and expressions of power. Strange architecture, items expressing not a utilitarian purpose but rather some property of the financial existence of the owner, homes built with absurd and impractical design philosophies. In Cruelty Squad, where the human is a financial product, the excess energy appears as literally mutated flesh creatures, walls built out of human flesh, faces appearing in stone and metal. See, I think the thematics and endings of Cruelty Squad are most fundamentally about human reactions to their interactions with value. Cruelty Squad explores the meaning of value by shifting the value of the one thing that we have an intuitive understanding of the value of, life. As primitive apes, we don't interact with value much. Items that were valuable were valuable because they were consumable. A monkey doesn't have too much of a concept of property, of anything that could be described as capital. 
but by advancing technology to the point that items become useful beyond their ability to be eaten, we inherently have to learn this new sense of value and how to interact with it. Cruelty Squad asks you to re-examine your understanding of the sense of value by making you question how things should be valued. Those unintuitive designs that we discussed earlier, their lack of correspondence does not try to tell us something about design, that's not their purpose. It's trying to force us to ask ourselves why we don't value them. In our world, when you view certain things and certain ways of designing things, you assign them value. Think of a nice condo downtown versus an apartment block in the suburbs. In this world, the people see these buildings as indicators of wealth. Why? More importantly, why do you not agree with this world's interpretation of certain indicators as indicators of wealth? How come your value judgments of these things are different from that of the inhabitants of this world? And eventually, as you learn the mechanics and you gain a sense of space and the perspective of this world, are you actually acclimating to their understanding of the value of things? Clearly the most explicit way that Cruelty Squad explores this concept is the deconstruction of the value of life. It's not explicitly clear at first that death is impermanent in this world. It's something that can be surmised relatively quickly and relatively easily, but you're never told this in a clear-cut way. Does your perception of your assassinations change when you discover that your targets simply come back to life, even canonically speaking? Do you make an attempt, however half-hearted, to not kill civilians in the early stages, only to indiscriminately clear rooms later on? When I started doing that, it isn't because I realized that these NPCs don't care about their lives, but rather the realization that it really did not matter, mechanically speaking, if I killed them. Just like this guy, I still got paid. However, the end result was the same. Cruelty Squad used my own sense of valuing things in a game to get me to not care about human life. Three repeating concepts dominate the thematics in Cruelty Squad. Literally divided and placed as like snake creature things, the Triagons and the house level. It can be surmised that these snakes are the creators of this world. The first Triagon is the Triagon of life. It created life from nothing in the universe, likened to a disease that takes hold and progresses. The second Triagon is suffering. It introduces limits to biology through metabolism. Movement of energy is limited. Limitation was placed on life. The third Triagon saw the excess energy no longer usable by life, and it cut a hole in the boundary created by the second Triagon. The excess energy flowed into life. What the game likens to an acquisition of souls, what it calls the great transaction. The hole was mended, but the presence of the excess energy in life created value, because now the excess energy they held could be lost. This Triagon is death. The endings to Cruelty Squad are, perhaps, representative of potential reactions towards value. Cruelty Squad has three different endings. In the first, you slay Abraxas, some kind of sun god thing. I theorize that Abraxas represents death. Upon its death, your character, just as humanity has in the world of Cruelty Squad, enters an infinite field where the sun shines bright, the sky is blue, and you will forever walk towards the goal in the distance. By killing death, by killing value, you create an endless, meaningless, but perhaps pleasant world of unremarkability. You have learned acceptance and forgiveness, but the sun shines down on you with eternal malice. You lack knowledge and understanding. You have not learned to deal with value. You have chosen the easy route. The second ending involves discovering hope eradicated difficulty, an even harder mode that allows you to open a door on the very first level leading eventually to a powerful boss. Killing this target grants the second ending. Here you simply stand, reflecting on the face of life as it instructs you on how to acquire power. Set a 10 year plan, wake up early, invest. Here you've decided to confront the reality of value and do the obvious thing, acquire it. Become a high net worth individual. You've embraced, and maybe now aim to kill, the second Triagon, suffering. In retrospect, this ending almost appears to be hyping you up for the third ending. This notion that you have to prepare for some overwhelming challenge is almost required to tackle the final secret stage. At this point, you've already gone down the path of the secret missions, and you're most likely dedicated to seeing through the final ending of the game. This final mission, Trauma Loop, is a nightmarish spectacle of frustrating level design and difficulty. You're not just a hitman animated by an internal trauma loop leading you to seek the goal of becoming a high net worth individual. You're stuck in this literal trauma loop of split second aiming and perfect movement that threatens to send you back to the start at the slightest mistake. 
Moreover, your implants, granting you abilities and much of your power, are disabled until you can kill a guy named the Limit Chancellor near the end of the level. If you have not perfected any of the skills in this game, you will be forced to do so here. The entire level revolves around finding some way to survive the sentence of, like hell, an enormous cavity at the bottom of the map filled to the brim with the absurdly powerful Necromex. If you manage this challenge, you will slowly approach the cradle of life itself, implied to be the source of the elimination of death in this world. It is of course surrounded by god mechs, which have a nearly unending health pool and will kill you in approximately 0.5 seconds. Once you manage to get past them somehow, for example by flying over them like that coward Arvin, you approach the cradle of life and destroy it? It's tough to say. From what you're told in the end cutscene, you succeed in becoming a high net worth individual. And maybe after eons of wielding this power, you destroy the world life. Is this you destroying the universe for how disgusting you have seen it to be? Or like some theorize, do you destroy the world to reintroduce death to create value? In this sense, you are the third triagon, death. After all, it's what you've done all game. Kill while accumulating transactional value, reminiscent of the game's strange connection between value and death. The third triagon brings about value by literally facilitating a grand transaction of energy into life. In this way, through manipulating depictions of things you have an intuitive understanding of, Cruelty Squad becomes bigger than the sum of its parts. What looks random, strange effects, colors, designs, combines to become something that uses its own seeming incoherence to ask interesting questions from the audience. I like to think that this ending represents the destruction of the order by you, only to recreate it in your own view. Instead of choosing to live in ignorance of value, instead of chasing it mindlessly, you choose to recreate it in your own view. You deny the obvious choices, and instead define the hardest questions of the human condition. You define it how you like it, and how they appear to you. Or maybe not, consumer soft products said that they made it all up on the fly. Alright, there is finally a, uh, a new video for the Arvin Koshbrash YouTube channel. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, I think, you know, it's important to note that this is definitely a game with a ton of different uh, possible interpretations. I kind of tried to stray away from maybe some of the more obvious ones to talk about something slightly more interesting. Uh, obviously there is, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot you can talk about in terms of what the game maybe implies about capitalism and whatnot. I think some of those some of those theories are a little bit simplistic sometimes, but that's that's besides the point. Um, this is definitely a game that you can you can really interpret in in a, in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, and this definitely was less of a an an analysis of the moment by moment of the game, like I did with let's say Far Cry or Firewatch. Uh, and it was more of, a, of like a thematic analysis, so I hope you found that interesting, uh, and I'll see you next year with the next upload.